and the match didn't happen. But what happened after that match didn't happen was even more astonishing. A press war, a, a, a letter war break, broke out in the Bombay press where essentially the European establishment from the governor downwards basically called the Parsis cheats. And they, and they used the strongest word in the British lexicon for this. And they said the Parsis are unsportsmanlike. And the Parsis then responded by saying, well, if you think we're unsportsmanlike, what do you say of your conduct? You would not let us appoint our own umpires in previous years. You've called off matches against us. And before this match, you actually threatened that we had to put a team on the field of play or you would not play us. That is not sportsmanlike too. I offer these illustrations just to show that this discourse that was constantly being put out, that cricket was an imperial game that brought together the colonizers and the colonized, often rings hollow when one actually examines the circumstances of cricketing encounters on the pitch between Europeans and Parsis in the 1890s. And this also shows that when people talk about the Parsis and the Europeans having a very good equation, perhaps if they looked at the realm of sport, they may be forced to rethink some of those assumptions. I've tried your patience for too long, so let me just end by saying that the Marxist intellectual C.L.R. James uh, famously declared, what do they know of cricket who only, know, who only cricket know? And he was, of course, riffing on Kipling. My talk today has sought to suggest that James's assertion may be fruitfully be applied to the history of Parsi cricket in colonial Bombay. Thank you very much. an amazing, amazing, amazing presentation on a game that captures the Indian imagination today beyond any doubt uh, on any uh, cricket pitch in any part of the world, any part of the country, no matter who's playing, whether it's a local team, a national team, a school team, a college team. Uh, the fervor with, with, it, with, it, with which it's played is uh, there for everyone in this nation to see. Um, I think I should just uh, ask for some questions before uh, making any comments. I'm sure uh, Professor Kadambi will be happy to take them. Yes, please identify yourself uh, because you know who we are. Uh, we'd like to know who you are. Thank you. Um, the story of the uh, contest between the Parsis and the Hindus and the Europeans is a story of the early 1900s. And it is a fascinating story. If I had more time uh, in my book, I'd talk about this. In fact, I've just finished writing the chapter on Parsi-Hindu cricket. Uh, that really starts in the, uh, basically what happens is in 1892, uh, the Europeans realized that individual teams like the Bombay Gymkhana can no longer play against the Parsis and win. So what they do is they amalgamate all the different European teams into one unit called the Bombay Presidency, so to have more numbers. And they then challenge the Parsis in 1892. Having stopped playing them for two years in 1890, they then decide if maybe if you have a lot of players from different clubs coming together as one team, we'll be standing a better chance, we'll stand a better chance. So in 1892, they initiate what came to be known as the Presidency Match. So between 1892 and 1907, you had these annual presidency matches between the Parsis, uh, between the Europeans and the Parsis. 
by, uh, you see, what happens is by the early 1900s, these presidency matches basically, because you had now increasing number of clubs, and the Parsi cricket club was no longer as dominant by the late 1890s. So the Parsi team used to be represented by the different clubs. And there used to be arguments about who, you know, who should represent the Parsi, you know, which club should uh, sort of represent the Parsis, uh, you know, where the players should be selected from. And over time, the Parsi cricket club itself becomes less important. In, from the early 1900s, the Hindus, you know, Hindu cricket clubs, and remember, cricket is organized on communal lines throughout this period. So the Hindu cricket clubs have started becoming better. And one of the points of antagonism they have at the Parsis, from 1902 onwards, is that they think they should be given parity on the cricket field. They too should get a match against a presidency team like the Parsis. And both the presidency team and the Parsis refused this for a long time. It was only in 1906 uh, that the presidency agrees to play a team called the Hindu uh, Gymkhana, you know, the, the Hindu team. Um, and then in 1907, you have the first Parsi Hindu game. So that's how you have the birth of the triangular. In 1912, then the Muslims put up their own team. It becomes a quadrangular. And in 1937, you have a, a team called the Rest, which has people who weren't Hindus, Muslims. Uh, you know, so you had a you know Buddhists and Jews and um, Christians. They form a team called the Rest. Uh, so that's how it became the pentangular. So the period I'm talking about in this paper is actually before uh, the triangular really starts. But this question of who represents is constantly, constantly at play, whether it's Parsi presidency matches or once the Hindus come on, the question of who represents, uh, you know, uh, and who gets the chance to play, and who will be a representative, what will be a representative team, is always a sticking point with Indian cricket from the very outset. To an extent, yes. Uh, I mean, this is an argument that is also taken up by Homi Baba, who you know talks about this idea of uh, you know something being both a resemblance and a menace. You know, sort of it's this idea of uh, the same but not quite. You know, uh, the idea that in creating these people who become like mimic men, it produces anxiety amongst the colonizers. But amongst the colonized, too, the primary motive is to become like the colonizer. I think one of the things that I, the problems I have with that argument is that it somehow takes the, it, it reduces the agency of these, of the colonized, because it seems as if all agency is reduced to an act of mimicry. Uh, and mimicry itself can be actually, uh, I, I'm not sure if mimicry is the right term, but this act of taking on something that belongs, appropriating something that isn't yours, can also be quite creative. I mean, if you think of the Parsis, the reason I was talking about that instance where they were talking about the roots of cricket, and you know, that cricket was discussed in the Shahnama, and going back 2,000 years to look for the roots of cricket, that suggests that they were not simply uh, happy saying cricket is an English game and we are copying it. They were saying, actually, we invented cricket before you guys even thought about it. Uh, and so it seems to, and the act of taking on something which isn't yours I think the one element that is missing in contemporary discussion, you know, the theoretical discussions of this in people like Baba and others, is that they tend to take the complexity out of the choice. But any act of choosing involves a great deal of complexity, not simply what you choose, how you choose, what the consequences of that choice are. These are not simply things that can be done in fits of absent-mindedness. So it takes some of that struggle, it takes some of that contestation, it takes some of that conflict out of it. It makes it seem like a very automatic thing, oh, I just decided to imitate someone else. But think of it in your own practice when you do something. Is it simply you trying to be like someone else or is your, are you also exercising some agency, some consciousness of thought? I think we need to bring that back.
research at uh, some years of the Bombay Gazette. And by the early 1900s, in some of the offices in Bombay, you had mixed teams. You had, had Parsis playing alongside Hindus, alongside uh, Europeans. So, so there is a story there too, which is not very easily assimilable to this larger narrative. Uh, but my sense is that what is key is if the team was seen to be representing the community in some sense, then that kind of mixture becomes difficult. You know, if you represent an office, then it's one thing. But if you're representing your community, and remember that the community identity was what was valorized in the colonial period. That was the identity that was accorded primacy over all others. So I think that probably had something to do with it. But having your point is an interesting one. I do think that Pune develops its own cricketing culture. And I think that also makes for, you know, it calls for more research, really. I mean, we talk about Indian cricket in very general terms. I think it would be very interesting to bring uh, class, caste, region, the, all those different variables which gives it its rich texture, you know. If there are no more questions, uh, I'd act, like to add a few comments and some of my own thoughts, which I am told I have the privilege of doing in the chair. Uh, I would firstly like to thank the Asiatic Society, Mr. Kale, all the members of the committee, Dr. Meena, Mrs. Vispi, uh, other committee members, uh, Murli for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here. And I'm really delighted that I was privileged to chair this evening. I, when I got this invitation, I said, why are they doing this to me? I know so little about cricket. And then, of course, it's the Gulistan Rustam Bilimoria Endowment uh, Lecture. And I regret deeply that though she died in 1972, I must have met her through my mother or my grandmother but I have no, re sadly have no recollection. But she was really brought to life to many of us in the museum world and maybe here at the Asiatic through the late uh, Mrs. Katie Mehta because she worked very hard in establishing this endowment, I know, at the Asiatic and definitely at the KR Kama and also a teaching component for fun things for children at the museum and uh, a lecture there as well. So I thought that was the connection. But when I delved a little deeper, three years ago, four years ago almost, I was, uh, for my good luck or bad luck, was chairperson of the NGMA. And suddenly out of the blue, the Secretary Culture sent us a message 
that uh, we have to put on an exhibition on cricket in four months' time in South Africa. You were involved in that. And uh, I s politely said, no, it's nothing to do with contemporary Indian art. Please excuse us. Go, go to the National Museum, you know, passing the buck. And the uh, National Museum said, uh, we have no staff, we have nothing. So we went to our good friends, the Nehru Science Center. And they have a lot of autonomy, including financial. So we said, uh, okay, we'll do the exhibition, uh, traveling exhibition in South Africa to coincide with the visit of Dr. Manmohan Singh to South Africa. And that's when I actually started looking at cricket and discovered the third empire, umpire. I said, we've got to get this in because it's going to be very interesting if we can get the third umpire in and then have a little game or some sort of an interactive part in that museum display for the South African people who come to see this exhibition. It went off very well. We brought out a catalog and we thought, shabash, we did a good job, end of cricket. No, lo and behold, Prime Minister Modi is going to visit Australia. So can we put up an exhibition, India and Australia? I said, that's a really tough one. Again, three months time, very little, but we had a lot of research. And every time the Parsi cricket team kept on coming into the picture. Now, two months ago, we are told, India in the UK and UK in India, can you do an exhibition on cricket? Quickly, India and the UK. We've come across a stumbling block because India and the UK, all very well, but we used to have a regular test match and things like that. And then we had the Prudential World Cup, and now we have the Reliance World Cup. Sadly, records of that are with Reliance. BCCI, and here I'd like to say, we may not have a Parsi cricket, cricketer on any team anywhere in the world today, but we have Diana Edelji, and she does us very proud because she has been appointed with Ramchandra Guha to sort out this BCCI. I don't want to give it any name, but I think everybody here knows what I'm refer referring to. And you mentioned about prize money. What are we talking about today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's mind boggling. So um, in percentage wise, and we may be small, but we still have a voice and uh, we still command a lot of respect. And I'm really delighted when I read in the paper that uh, a woman had been selected and to top it all, she was a Parsi. Now, whether she's thinking about her Persian roots, I don't know, but uh, we are indeed very happy that this has happened. Um, I did do a little bit of reading. I, like to be a little prepared, and I found out something about my own little history, that uh, Manchesha Godridge uh, played cricket, and Pavri has mentioned him in his book, so I need to look that up a little further. And uh, Shapurji Barjorji Spencer was also part of the team. Now, that's, these are di uh, direct, uh, like grandfather's brother, so I need to do a little bit of homework myself. 17 or 15 or 18 Parsi cricket teams, I think it's a huge amount for a small community like this to put forth more than 100 years ago. I think it's the passion, whether we won or we didn't win. We were out there with 10,000 people cheering us on in those days on the Maidans of Bombay. So extremely, extremely uh, encouraging. Uh, this is a talk which I've really enjoyed sharing. And I hope all of you in the audience have enjoyed uh, listening to it. It's a game that, uh, as I said earlier, has captured the imagination of every uh, schoolgirl, schoolboy on every street corner. And it's our game. I mean, you want to claim it back, you'll have to fight for it. But it really is an international sport which is in completely taken, India has taken to its heart. So thank you very, very much for having both of us here. May I say so? And uh, I hope you all have enjoyed the evening just as much as uh, Professor Kidambi, I know, has worked very hard and uh, to present it to us. And we are looking forward to the book 
and I will be the first one to ask you for a pirated edition. Thank you. Uh, and for the audience for turning up. Uh, I'm sorry if I went a bit uh, over the, uh, sort of the time allotted to the speakers, but that is the problem with some, a subject like this, that one never knows when to stop. So it's a problem I'm having with my book. So anyway, yes. I hope it will be out there soon in the world. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I feel um, privileged myself to be here to deliver the vote of thanks. And I'm fortunate that I'm not in the position that the governor was when he had prepared a speech to praise the English team that lost because I came to praise and I will continue to do so since I have um, grounds to do that. Um, I think you will all agree with me that we have to thank um, Dr. Prashant Dambi because um, I think he revealed so much to us. Um, oh, yeah, of course, I think we all know about cricket. Um, you can't not know if you're uh, Indian. But um, since you mentioned Diana Edelji, uh, she used to be a student at Jaihin College, where I've been teaching uh, uh, for so many years. And I used to play in the staff versus student cricket match. And Diana bowled me, clean bowled me, uh, when I had actually scored seven runs. That's been my highest score. Never got into double-digit figures. But we used to have great fun. Every year we had this staff versus um, student uh, match. And then we thought the students were getting too good for us. So we said it's not fair. So we will have staff students in one team and staff and students in the other team to be more evenly matched. But Diana, and so I was really happy when I saw her name there since you mentioned it on this, um, in, I think it's a sort of um, um, midway uh, arrangement uh, to sort out things. And I think uh, she's a wonderful uh, woman. And she did so much for uh, women's cricket when it hadn't really caught on. I think it's caught on much more now. So I feel very fortunate also to be here today as a Parsi and fond of cricket and um, to thank you for all the marvelous things you've pointed out. Um, um, I think I um, agree with you that Parsis have been, and I think will always be a historical curiosity. And the way our numbers are dwindling, uh, we may then just become a, a curiosity for those who follow. But I think um, uh, we, we may not disappear that fast. I think there is a certain resilience amongst Parsis. Um, I was quickly, I think I had a good position to read uh, what you were projecting. And uh, having been a, an, an, I am an English teacher, I caught um, an interesting in that Bombay Gazette 1878 quote that you put up, where uh, one of the things mentioned for the Indian cricket team was speaking tolerably good English. So <laughs> that caught my eye in that um, quote that you had uh, put up. Um, so there's so much that you have told us about the way cricket didn't remain just a sport, but it became so much, as you said, part of the public discourse and that you couldn't then separate it from the politics of the time. And it's going to be very interesting to read uh, your book when uh, we have the good fortune to have it out. Feroza, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We've always been very keen on um, getting you here for um, many of our functions, and I know how busy you are. So when um, Dr. Mina Vaishambayan said, do you think Feroza might agree? I said, I'll try, I'll ask her, but I don't know. And we were delighted when you agreed, and I'm sure you will all agree that we couldn't have get, had a better person than Feroza Godrej to chair today's talk. Murli, thank you so much for undertaking to introduce our speaker and our chairperson. Um, somebody else who's been 
very interested in Parsis and I think knows much more about Parsis and their history than uh, many of us here. Uh, Mina Vaishambayan, I need to thank you for always getting silent speakers for us and thank you everyone. I'm sure you're happy that you were here today because I'm sure you got a lot out of today's talk. Thank you and good night.